TCS profit and margins fall to a nine quarter low despite a weak rupee and lower visa costs. Infosys will report numbers today. Chinese President Xi Jinping will arrive in Mahabalipuram in Tamil Nadu today for a two-day informal summit with Prime Minister Modi. And the Economic Offences Wing of the Delhi Police arrested former Fortis promoters Shivinder and Malvinder Singh on charges of siphoning funds from Redigare Finvest. We'll get to all those stories in a moment. Quick check on how the markets have been faring today. Yatin is here as always with a closer look at some of those stocks. Uh, good afternoon, Harsha. And, uh, you know, the markets have been uh, quite uh, volatile and choppy, uh, you know, for the first uh, few hours of trade. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, the uh, Nifty, right now only up by nearly 20 points. Uh, so, not much of a momentum seen as far as key benchmark indices are concerned. We opened gap down uh, by about, uh, you know, 30, 40 points uh, and have managed to recover the, uh, you know, losses that we made intraday. Uh, what's moving in trade is uh, Infosys. Uh, after TCS reported, reported the quarterly earnings and disappointed, uh, we had uh, you know a shift happening in uh, to uh, Infosys. That, that stock is up almost to two and a half percent uh, ahead of the quarterly earnings, which will be uh, reported post the market hours today. Altatec Cement, Hindustan Lever. Uh, as well as uh, uh, ONGC Cipla, the other stocks uh, which are gaining momentum in trade. In fact, Cipla uh, plunged as, as much as 7% in intraday trade after the uh, details of the 483 were uh, published by one of the brokerages. Uh, of course, uh, post that, uh, you know, note the stock saw some 7% intraday decline but has managed to recover from the day's low after the management clarified to Bloomberg Quinn that none of the observations issued by US FDA with respect to the Goa plant uh, had data integrity issues. Apart from uh, that, uh, the losing side uh, is also a long list. Uh, yes Bank, that stock continues to remain under pressure. Second day in a row, the stock is down. Uh, today, another 6% cut coming in. Uh, we also have the entire oil and gas pack on the PSU side, uh, you know, reeling under pressure. IOC, Gale and BPCL are not only the top oil and gas losers, but also the top losers as far as Nifty is concerned. Almost 2% down for Gale and similar is the trend with other oil marketing companies. In terms of active securities, uh, watch out for Indescent Bank. Uh, yesterday after the management commentary, uh, the stock managed to, uh, you know, open in the green but has been again under pressure, almost trading at the day's low. And also uh, in focus is SBI as well as IDEA. Again, both of these stocks are under pressure post the recent gains made. Yes, and thank you for that. It's not been the best start to the earnings season so far. Uh, Indian IT is the country's largest outsourcer. TC has reported its lowest margin in nine quarters at a time when the rupee depreciated and it, it had to spend less on visa costs as well. Sajid is here to tell us what happened. That's right, Harsha. You know, it's not been a uh, best quarter for TCS, especially because Q2 is supposed to be uh, a strong quarter, uh, and Q3 and Q4 are seasonally uh, weak quarters for uh, IT companies because of our lows and uh, you know low, low number of uh, days for work. But uh, in the case of TCS, we saw uh, the vo volumes or the uh, top line in not in uh, has been falling short of uh, the analyst expectation. And the bigger issue is that uh, the guidance which they had given at the beginning of the year. Uh, double-digit guidance which is 10% and above it's now it's at risk uh, because now that for the first half they are, they are at 8.5 percent growth and for the second half they may not be able to uh, get more than 10 percent to get that average of 10 percent above so that miss is going to come in in the full year for mm. TCS for sure uh, margin is also been a concern uh, they have been f uh, falling for the last first four to six quarters and now they're at 40 24 uh, percent which is uh, 170 bips uh, lower uh, than last year for the for half year half year and uh, there is no uh, uh, certainty that in it it may uh, bottom out at 24 percent because uh, as they go and go on build capacities and investments into the order book which they have been able to create of more than five billion or so uh, there uh, there is likelihood there may be some pressure which is going to come in of course the management says that they're going to bring in efficiencies to bring, ensure that there is uh, uh, you know we uh, there is enough buffer to maintain the margins there uh, the concern which is coming from the uh, from the interaction yesterday was that they're not able to convert many of the order books into revenues and that's primarily because some of the clients are taking longer time or the transformations are taking longer time to be decided uh, for in the digital space and <coughs> 
and TCS uh, in uh, in Q2 had 6.2 uh, billion dollars of uh, TC CC, which is the total contract value which they got the uh, from various clients, and that conversion is getting slower, and that's the reason why you are seeing a disappointment happening at the at the revenue end, which is there. Uh, another issue which uh, impacts them is the BFSI. Uh, Three quarters back, uh, the company said that they're seeing a, uh, you know, a positive uptake in BFSI. Now again, it is going down given the kind of macro conditions which they are in, especially in Europe and UK, which is because of the uncertain uh, Brexit which is coming in, and in Wall Street, where some of the top uh, banks are are taking a lot of time and have slowed the process of, uh, you know, implementing new technologies. Uh, though they claim that uh, mid-tier banks are adopting technologies much faster, uh, but a large portion of their revenues come from there. That's uh, one, and the retail is one where they're seeing some pushback happening um, of some of the orders, especially because retail is in a crisis in the U.S. Uh, the traditional retail is now giving way to the online retail and that's uh, leading to a lot of uh, uh, you know all traditional retail adopting our online technologies but more than that many of them are also going for you know bankruptcies so that's also hitting uh, TCS in that uh, space. Sajid, thank you so much for that. TCS may have missed the mark but will Infosys manage to sing, spring a surprise? Agam Vakil is here with what the market is expecting of his Infosys this time. Well, it's going to be another quiet quarter for Infosys. In terms of expectations, what we are looking at is around 2.8% uptick as far as revenues go sequentially. Revenue is likely to rise 3.7% in rupee terms, and we are expecting a 100 basis points expansion in EBIT margins at around 21.5%. We are likely to see profits rise 6.5% to around 4,045 crores. Now, we do see steady revenue growth, and that will be largely on ramp up in deals that we've, that the management has spoken about in the previous few quarters. Uh, as far as guidance is concerned, there are at least three brokerages who are expecting the company to up their guidance. As far as UBS and Kotak Institution are expecting uh, the emphasis to uh, will increase their guidance to around 9.5 to 10.5% in constant currency growth. And uh, well, as far as Prabhudas Leela is concerned, they're likely to see an uptick of around uh, well, 9%. That is the lower end of the guidance. The current guidance, of course, stands at around 8.5 to 10%. Operating margins are also expected to expand. Why? Because of wage hikes, which have been absorbed in the first quarter, rupee depreciation, again, the US dollar and of course seasonal moderation on account of lower visa costs. However, what we will be keeping an eye on is the company's commentary on BFSI vertical as well as well the state of the economy in the, the US as well as Europe. We're also keeping an eye on the total contract value, pipeline momentum and benefits in margins, if at all, on the back of localization efforts. But on the whole, not expecting any fireworks as far as Infosys is concerned. Thanks for that. Uh, that was IT, but what about consumer staples? Remember, Hindustan Unilever comes out with numbers today. A Bloomberg Quint uh, uh, conducted a, a, a survey, survey among nine distributors across eight states that doesn't paint a rosy picture at all. Charlene D'Souza is here with uh, findings of what that survey reveals. Yeah. Uh, so demand for consumer goods product failed to pick up in the quarter ended September despite the onset of the festive season. Uh, sales volume largely remained unchanged in the second quarter and the credit period, that is the time uh, between uh, you know, the payments are made by the retailer to the distributor after the stock is sent to them mm. that continue to remain high in fact it's gone to in some cases to almost two months high and uh, you know the issues that uh, distributors are facing is the same across all states uh, most states that we've spoken to actually uh, so let's go and see across states what's really happening in Maharashtra demand growth remained under pressure while credit days remained high in Mumbai growth was in low single digits in Goa uh, sales continued to be under pressure and credit days were in some cases going over a period uh, over a month in Telangana de demand remained stagnant while credit period also went over a month in Punjab uh, the same situation de demand continued to stay under pressure while credit period ranged between 21 to 45 days 
in West Bengal, despite festivities in the states, uh, you know, uh, it failed to revive consumer demands while inventory carrying days, that is a stock that's with the distributors, were over 15 days. In Uttarakhand, a distributor said that the, it is the worst quarter that they have seen in the last one year. In Delhi, NCR, again, uh, single uh, digit uh, demand growth, rather it's low single digit demand growth. And in Odisha, negative volume growth, but value growth is expected to be flat. Charlene, thank you so much for putting that in context. That's consumer, consumer space. The going's only going to get tough for automakers. The latest data released by CM shows a drop of more than 20% for the entire industry in India. Commercial vehicle players continue to be the most affected. Nishant is standing by with the segmental breakup. Nishant. Uh, well, well, we're right, Harsha. So the, the Indian auto oil sector continues with you know 11th month straight decline uh, as far as the wholesale number is concerned. The longest uh, ever prolonged uh, degrowth that we have seen, the industry has ever seen. Now coming back to the sectoral uh, breakout of different sector segments, uh, if you look at the passenger vehicle segment, it's declined by about 33.40 vehicle, that's passenger cars, and the overall passenger vehicle se uh, segment dived by about 23.69%. If you come to the commercial vehicle segment, that saw the worst dip uh, this time around. Uh, total commercial vehicle sales declined by about 62.11 percent uh, and while the two-wheeler uh, sales were down by about 22.09 percent and if you look at in two wheelers the motorcycle sales were down by 23.29 uh, percent that's uh, that's the sharpest uh, fall that we have seen in the last two decades now uh, Siam during the press conference says that uh, thanks to the measure that the company uh, the government has announced in the last couple of weeks they are seeing some improvement and uptake in uh, demand both in terms of uh, footfall uh, of customers coming to the dealership and also the conversion rate as well and and they're expecting uh, that going forward uh, they will be some sort of us uh, 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 as compared to the uh, first half of the year there will be a better growth they expect to see in the second half of the year but the two things that will play a crucial role is that you know uh, Going ahead as well, we will see more production cut because the companies will have to, OEMs will have to ensure that there are no vehicles, zero uh, BS4 inventory uh, by the end of March 2020. And another key factor that will play a role is the availability of fuel uh, 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 when the BS6 uh, kicks in. Shan, thank you so much for that. The economic effects wing of the Delhi police has arrested former Fortis promoters Shivinder and Malvinder Singh. They've been charged with siphoning funds from Relief Invest, a lender they control. Bloomberg's Ari Alstad now joins us with the latest. Ari, what really is going on? You've been covering these uh, the brothers for a while. Uh, this was coming? Um, well, it came as a surprise to me, mm. but um, I mean, essentially, this is in reaction to a complaint that uh, the Singh brothers' former financial services firm, Relegare, filed with the Delhi police, uh, basically saying that under their control, the lending unit of Relegare had made all these loans to firms secretly controlled by the Singhs, and then the Singhs or these firms had defaulted on the loans, essentially siphoning the money out. So the the company had made this complaint with the police months ago. Um, and now, suddenly, after all this time has passed, the police are acting on it. Mm. And this is not just the Singh brothers, their uh, former CEO has also, also been arrested. That's right. Uh, three other of their uh, top deputies in Relegare and the lending unit of Relegare have also been arrested. And uh, they should be appearing in court in, in Delhi uh, right about now, actually. All right. Thanks so, so much for that. That's uh, the story of, the, of Malvinder and Shivinder Singh. The U.S. drug regulator has issued a Form 483 with 12 observations for Cipla's Goa plant. This is uh, a multi-dosage facility that makes both oral and injectable drugs. But the management assures that there are no data integrity issues at the plant. Let's listen to what Cipla's global CFO, Kedar Upadhyay, had to say. There is no data integrity related observations. There is no repeat observation. You know, the contents of the 483, if you read, uh, it pertains to uh, equipments, uh, infrastructure, some of the procedures. We believe they are quite addressable. We are in the process now to work with the agency to see a resolution of this matter. You know, the near-term pipeline from this site is uh, quite limited. And we have an active de-risking program, at least for the critical products. The attempt is to have more than one site. So at this stage, there is no risk to the existing business. Even amidst the current market correction, there are some stocks that are trading at a significant premium. Samit Sarkar is standing by with a list of India's most expensive stocks. Samit. 
So I start off with the selection criteria first. We have selected stocks that are tracked by more than 10 analysts. In that, we have listed down top five stocks in the with highest 12 month forward price to earnings multiple, excluding the companies belonging to the banking and the NBFC space. Starting off with Avenue Supermarts, the share prices have run off nearly 40 percent in the last one year, making it India's most expensive stock. Now, this rally could be attributable to the 30 percent plus revenue growth and 19 percent uh, net profit growth reported by the company every quarter in the last one year. Now, along with this, uh, low public float could also be one of the reasons behind this rally in the share prices of Avenue Supermarts. For trend, it is the street has been bullish on the, on the back of the highest ever store additions, store a store of a strong operating metrics and large funders, most of which has come through from the promoters. Also reduced losses in Star Bazaar has kept the street bullish for trend. HDFC Life comes third on the list. Now, strong performance of the credit protect business despite macro headwinds, superior value of the new business margins coupled with continued demand for its Sunshine Plus product has led to a 57% rally in HDFC Life share price in the last one year. Now, for Nestle India, it was faster growth than peers in the first half of 2019 and 2018, which has kept its valuations elevated. Now, this strong uh, volume growth was aided by its differentiated distribution strategy, more product launches, aggressive advertising spend, and fresh capital expenditure. Fifth on the list is Godred Properties and with gains of over 50% is the highest gain on the Nifty Realty Index. Now, these gains are mainly on the back of consolidation seen among the cash-starved small and medium players which led to market share gains for Godred Properties along with that growth in joint development portfolios and a strong parentage also aided the growth for Godred Properties and kept its valuations elevated. So, man, thank you for that. Let's move on now and talk about aluminum. Aluminum prices fell to their lowest in three years amid trade tensions between US and China. The falling demand from the automobile sector has only made things worse. But how much will this affect Indian producers? Nikki Machandani is standing by with some analysis. Well, thanks, Harsha. Uh, clearly, uh, the prices being at three-year low is not a problem. What pro The problem is, what's the reason behind the three-year low prices? And that's a little graver out there. But then we're looking at changing industry dynamics as a whole. Uh, what also goes behind the making of why these prices have uh, slided to a three-year low number is also because of the softer raw material prices. Let's look at uh, why, what has changed dynamically for the industry as a whole. It's the forecast, essentially. Uh, Kotex Securities put up a note where it suggested that they expect the industry now to be in a surplus situation of as much as 0.3 million ton by 2020 as compared to a deficit that uh, the industry is witnessing right now to an extent of 0.4 MTPA. Besides that, uh, we are. Uh, what actually leads to this kind of forecast is the oversupply situation right now uh, where the China is expected to add another 4 MTPA from a period of 2019 to 21 on account of ease and pollution controls uh, that the authorities in China had levied on these country uh, on these companies as a whole. Also, if you look at the demand scenario, where you have a result presentation which suggested that the automobile sector, essentially a consumer sector, which uh, uh, you know is the 30 percent of the demand comes in from that sector, that particular sector, Rusal, the top uh, aluminium producer in the presentation has suggested that global automobile production has fallen by more than seven percent in the first half of this uh, uh, 2019 year, as compared to that we've seen in 2018. Also, one more comment commentary from. Alcoa, where uh, uh, the company trimmed the demand growth estimate to 1.25 percent to 2.25 percent from an earlier estimate of around a two to three odd percent. So clearly, they're expecting some amount of subdued demand there. So oversupply situation combined with the subdued demand leads to a projection of surplus situation. Second point, which has actually led or weighed on the prices of aluminium, is uh, the, uh, the raw material prices since it moves along the value chain. Uh, alumina prices they have corrected by as much as good 20% from June onwards, which is expected to exert a downward pressure on aluminium prices. How does that impact uh, uh, the domestic players? Because the, the domestic prices are linked to LME prices. And every 1% change has an impact on uh, the EPS performance of the company. Just look at the sensitivity analysis out there, Hindalco, Nalco and Vedanta. The portion of sensitivity is higher for Nalco because it's an integrated player producing both alumina as well as aluminium. So every change in 1% will bring in a 12% EPS change for, Hind uh, for Nalco. Second will be uh, Hindalco. And last in the list, we're looking at Vedanta, given the kind of portfolio mix it has right now. Back to you. 
Nikhi, thank you so much for that. Xi Jinping touches down in India today. Narendra Modi and the Chinese president will spend the next two days in the coastal town of Mamalapuram in Tamil Nadu holding informal talks in the, in the second of such talks initiated by both sides. While no formal announcements are expected to come out of these talks, it, it comes at a time when China is, is seen to be siding with Pakistan on the Kashmir issue. So how important are these uh, talks and how, should we expect anything tangible to come out of these uh, in the next two days? Let's ask Neelam Dio, former India, India ambassador and director at Gateway House. Neelam, thank you so much for joining us on, on the show. Uh, sure. You know, this is being touted as an informal summit. Are you expecting any concrete business to get done or is this going to be largely about symbolism and bonhomie? No, no, no. I think a lot of very important business gets done. It's just that a lot of announcements don't get made. But in this particular one, even though it is an informal summit, I have seen from the schedule that there is actually going to also be delegation talks, which means that there will be officials uh, from both sides who will be having more detailed, more concrete uh, talks. Uh, the other thing is that I think that certainly uh, the Kashmir issue should be taken up. I don't know whether it will come from our side or from uh, the Chinese president, but it's an important issue. It has. Uh, made the relationship even a little worse mm. in the last few days, especially with the visit of the Pakistani Prime Minister to uh, Beijing. At the end of that visit, uh, China announced that they would support each other's core interests. Core is a word that the Chinese normally use in a pretty uh, serious uh, way. They treat Tibet or Taiwan as core issues. Mm. So to say that, uh, I think is not helpful a day before their president is coming to India. Uh, Neelam, from a business standpoint, what would India want from Beijing? They want, I mean, obviously they want greater market access, they want investment, uh, the budget deficit is a point of concern from Beijing's standpoint. Uh, what do both these countries want? So I think there's actually going to be quite a lot of discussion on trade matters. Mm. You would have seen that our commerce minister just made a statement that India cannot stay out of the RCEP, the Regional Trade Agreement. Uh, both countries have economies that are slowing down. Both countries have certain sectors which are really hurting. And ours, for instance, automobile may be the most prominent in discussions, but other industries are also hurting. So I think there will be quite a lot of discussion on trade matters. And the big sort of holdup, in the RCEP discussions has actually been uh, India wanting to lengthen the period in which it lowers its tariffs on, uh, in, uh, on uh, import of Chinese goods, mm. while the Chinese obviously want India to, raise, uh, to reduce tariffs on 90% of goods. I think we are asking for 80%. Mm. But that, so maybe the two uh, principals, uh, uh, President Xi and Prime Minister Modi, will not discuss these details. Mm. But I think there will be a discussion. On, on the other side, there's no question, I think, that the Chinese will bring up Huawei. Yeah. Uh, as you know, not only the Americans, but many of the Europeans and certainly the EU's own economic plan, mm. uh, Australia, New Zealand, they have all backed off. I don't know what happened with the UK, which had earlier said that they can handle the security aspects. Mm. But I don't know if UK is being serious about anything at all these days. Mm. Uh, so I think the question of whether we are going to allow Huawei to be one of the companies that will join the bids for the 5G architecture is bound to come in. Come in. Maybe not in those kind of micro terms, mm. but I, I have no doubt the Chinese will bring it up. And on our part, of course, we will must persist with demanding that they remove their non-tariff barriers on exports mm. from India of pharmaceuticals, auto parts, uh, agricultural commodities, because the imbalance, the trade imbalance is now $70 billion mm. last year's figures. Sure. Neelam, we we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Neelam, for joining us with your quick perspective on the, the Modi, Prime Minister Modi and President Xi meeting uh, in an informal summit at Mahabalipuram in, in Tamil Nadu. After the first round of meetings with Chinese officials in Washington, the U.S. President, President Donald Trump, meanwhile, sounded quite upbeat. He said that the trade talks went very well the first day and assured that it would continue uh, today as well. Listen in. We just 
completed a negotiation with China. We're doing very well. We're having another one tomorrow. I'm meeting with the vice premier over at the White House. And I think it's going really well. I will say, I think it's going really well. So how do you quantify very well? Uh, Selena Wang of uh, Bloomberg News tells us just that. I think we should not take so much weight to Trump's comments, but place more weight on the fact that he is meeting with Vice Premier Liu He on Friday. That is a sign that there must be some sort of progress that's being made. Otherwise, Vice Premier Liu He would not agree to meet with Donald Trump. Now, despite all of the escalating rhetoric we've been seeing around visa restrictions, blacklists, Hong Kong issues, it does seem like both sides are now more willing to make some concessions to reach a mini deal or a partial deal that wouldn't see China to make any core concessions, but would result in perhaps more agricultural purchases, but no giving in on major sticking points around its economic and industrial policy. Now, there have been reports that the U.S. has reportedly allowed some U.S. companies to start reselling to Huawei when it comes to non-sensitive supplies. According to our sources, China has also asked the U.S. to remove sanctions on its largest shipping company, Costco, which had earlier been accused for carrying Iranian oil so that being said, we have been here before. Trump does want a broad trade deal. We could still see Trump come back with more tariffs in hopes of China reaching a bigger deal. Selena Wang reporting from Beijing. Out of time on the show. Thank you so much for joining us today.